A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards, and I'm glad you joined the program today. Steve Gutowski of The Reload going to be with us here in just a couple of minutes. We're going to be talking about David Chipman's uh, confirmation hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee on Wednesday. Uh, also, however, we're going to be talking about that in the context, the larger context, of the Biden administration's uh, plan to weaponize the ATF. Uh, and to use that agency as an end run around Congress. We're already starting to see this with the first of at least two proposed rules coming out from the ATF. The uh, first proposed rule, public comment period, is now open, uh, dealing with redefining some terms uh, in the Gun Control Act of 1968. Things like frame, receiver, and even the word readily. Uh, as it applies to readily convertible items or things that can be readily converted into firearms. Uh, we've also got this other proposed rule that has not been released yet. If uh, the Department of Justice and the ATF are on track, then next Friday we will likely see the release of another proposed rule, uh, this one dealing with AR-style pistols and stabilizing braces. And we haven't seen a draft copy of this rule yet, but we know that the intent of the Biden administration uh, is, in essence, to make these AR-style pistols, uh, to redefine them as short-barreled rifles and to throw them under the auspices of the National Firearms Act. Uh, this is not necessarily a new strategy. We actually saw this with the ATF during the, Bum or during the uh, Trump administration with the bump stock ban. Uh, but this is certainly a bigger, broader uh, path to a, a gun ban via executive action. And one of the things we'll be talking about with Stephen Gutowski is whether or not the Biden administration might try to do the same thing when it comes to some automatic firearms. You know, the quote unquote assault weapons that uh, David Chipman talked about uh, during his confirmation hearing saying that he couldn't define them. But he knows that they should be illegal for civilians to own. Uh, before we get to our conversation with Stephen Gutowski, though, let me remind you once again that the fight for our right to keep their arms is real. It is taking place not only in Washington, D.C., but in state capitals around the country. And while we are making progress in a lot of states, I no doubt about it. I mean, we're seeing success in uh, places like Texas, Utah, Montana, uh, Iowa, Tennessee, we know that there are other states that pose a challenge to gun owners and our right to keep their arms. And certainly the uh, anti-gun threat from the Biden administration is very, very real. And we need every gun owner right now to be active, to be engaged, to be a, a part of the fight in defense of our right to keep and bear arms. And an easy way for you to do that is to text JOIN SAF to 474747 and become a Second Amendment first responder. Again, you can text JOIN SAF. 247 and become a part of that grassroots army that is defending the right to keep and bear arms from sea to shining sea. All right, again, let's uh, turn our attention now, not only, as I said, to David Chipman's uh, testimony yesterday, and he was rightfully blasted uh, by senators like Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, Marsha Blackburn, John Kennedy, uh, over his, you know, decades worth of comments about... Uh, the need to ban firearms, his mocking of first-time gun owners, the fact that he's been a paid gun control lobbyist since leaving the ATF after a 25-year career there. Democrats, on the other hand, they really tried to downplay David Chipman's anti-gun activism and instead talked uh, with him quite a bit about his time at the ATF. I have no idea whether or not uh, Chipman did enough damage to himself to force Democrats like Joe Manchin to uh, uh, block his nomination, I'm guessing we'll see in the next couple of weeks. But, you know, as we spoke with uh, Alan Gottlieb of the Second Amendment Foundation just a couple of days ago, even if Chipman is blocked as permanent director of the ATF, Biden can name him a, um, you know, basically a, a temporary director, an interim director. And, yeah, his wings would be clipped a little bit. Uh, but there's no doubt that one way or the other, the Biden administration views the ATF as one of its keys to advance its anti-gun agenda, particularly with uh, the filibuster still in place in the Senate and 60 votes not present for the type of gun ban that Joe Biden wants to put in place. So with that as the backdrop, let's spend some time with our friend Stephen Gutowski of The Reload here on Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. Mr. Gutowski, how are you, sir? Appreciate you coming on the show today. 
Doing good. How are you, Cam? Uh, you know, I'm I'm okay. Uh, I, I'm a little concerned about uh, David Chipman getting confirmed as ATF director and what that might mean for our gun rights. But uh, other than that, I'm I'm feeling okay. Yeah, yesterday was a big day with the hearing. Uh, we got to see, I guess, uh, exactly what he's willing to stand by and what he's willing to apologize for uh, in, in regards to his comments and positions he's taken over the years. Uh, and so I think we got a lot of new information out of that. Absolutely. Uh, and and he, he did apologize for a couple of his lies. Um, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting is uh, – uh, either the fact that he tried to separate his gun control activism from his own personal feelings almost, right? Like he, he said when he was talking about his support for a gun ban, well, yeah, I, I said these things, you know, in my role as a as an advocate. But if I'm the head of the ATF, well, I'll, I'll only follow the law, ignoring the fact that if he is appointed as permanent director of the ATF, he's going to be setting policy. It's not that he's just going to be following the dictates of Congress. He's going to have an awful lot of room to maneuver on his own. Yeah, I mean, that's a. I think that's a big point about uh, Chipman's nomination, right? He did try to make that distinction between what he's argued for over the last decade or more as a gun control advocate and how he would perform his duties as a director. But I think the reality is, uh, I mean, you know, for instance, like he wouldn't he wouldn't give a personal definition of what his sole weapon is, even though he he admitted that he still supports both banning them and also adding all of the currently owned ones to the National Firearms Act registry. Um, and so he wants to do that to assault weapons, but he also wouldn't define what he believes an assault weapon is. Um, and that's a problem when you're talking about the person who's going to be in charge uh, of enforcing such a regulation if it were to be passed by Congress. Um and and so, you know, he, he definitely tried to walk a line there of not he didn't walk back any of his positions that he's held uh, as a gun control activist necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but he did try to say he wouldn't necessarily bring that into the job with him. And I, I don't know how that it seems like a hard sell, I think, to a lot <laughs> of senators that aren't already inclined to vote for him. A absolutely. Um, and I don't know how you can I mean, honestly, I don't know how he can say that with a straight face, given what we've already seen from the Biden administration in terms of these two proposed rules. Um, you know, though the first one that's already been released, redefining uh, terms like frame, receiver, uh, even the word readily. Right. They want to they want to redefine what it means to to be readily converted uh, into a firearm. Uh, but they, they, it's the actual word readily that they're trying to redefine. And they've got this other proposed bill or this other proposed rule, excuse me, that they're working on now, Stephen. If the Biden administration, I guess, stays on track, then next Friday we should see the uh, uh, press release from the ATF announcing their proposed rule on uh, AR style pistols and stabilizing braces. And what we've heard from Biden himself, it sure sounds like, is they're trying to figure out a way to reclassify uh, those firearms as short barreled rifles and put them all under the auspices of the National Firearms Act. Yeah, certainly. Um, if you listen to what President Biden has said, uh, that seems to be what he wants to do. Uh, I guess Attorney General Garland was a little bit less expansive in his comments, and maybe they just want to define some of these braces uh, or braced uh, ARs as as SBRs, and it's not clear exactly what the line would be yet. Um, so, although if you look last year at the, the proposal that the ATF put out um, under the Trump administration, uh, which was eventually uh, shot down by DOJ um, with the help of uh, Mitch McConnell and, and Attorney General uh, Barr at the time, you know, that really was, was very similar to what they've done now with the, the redefining uh, firearm frame or receiver in that it, it was just basically completely subjective um, and essentially said that, you know, a anything with a brace could be an SBR. Um, and there's really no way to tell sort of like a Schrodinger's uh, SBR situation. <laughs> it could be, or it might not be. And the only way to know is if the ATF directly looks at your exact configuration um, of your specific gun and obviously they won't do that if you, you can't like send your gun to the ATF to have them take a look and give you the all clear or I guess arrest you and send you to jail if they don't like it. Um, so it's kind of, uh, yeah, the, the ATF wants these extremely expansive uh, 
authorities. Uh, now, they don't necessarily say that they want to enforce up to the very limits of those authorities, but they want to have them so that they can have broad you know, leeway in, in how they operate, uh, which goes back to the issue with Chipman um, and him trying to say that he would only enforce the laws. Well, even if that's, you know, true, uh, enforcement of these laws from the ATF's perspective seems to be something that's extremely uh, uh, expansive uh, in, in the authority that they want granted to them. And, and that, yeah, you, you don't necessarily need to pass a new law to make millions of guns suddenly illegal. Uh, under the way the ATF wants to operate, so uh, right, absolutely, and I don't want to, I don't want to put the cart before the horse too much, but I'm going to do it a little bit um, because you know I, I want to see what the actual uh, proposed rule on uh, stabilizing braces looks like, but. <laughs> You know, you you hear David Chipman talk about how uh, AR-15s and semi-automatic uh, rifles uh, should be basically treated like machine guns uh, and and regulated under the NFA. And I got to tell you, Stephen, I'm a, I'm a little concerned here that uh, the Biden administration, if they really wanted to, you know, embrace the anti-gun ideology and and the anti-gun agenda of groups like Giffords and uh, Every Town for Gun Safety, that they could. Uh, declare that, all right, you know what, um, under under our new definitions, all of these semi-automatic rifles could be readily converted into machine guns, right? Because you wouldn't need eight hours in a machine shop or $60,000 worth of tools to turn a semi-auto uh, into a full auto. Uh, and so just as we want to regulate, uh, you know, AR-style pistols and put them under the NFA, we think that we have the authority to do that with every so-called assault weapon in the United States without a vote by Congress. Yeah, I mean, certainly you could see how they could get there in theory, especially when you look at something like the bump stock ban, which effectively just kind of lied about what a bump stock is. Like mm -hmm. that, that regulation just sort of said, this is a machine gun now, um, <clears throat> even though before we determined it wasn't. Uh, and you've seen the ATF obviously go back and forth on pistol braces over the years here. Um, and, and they really, they're, <clears throat> the, the, I think the bump stock ban especially raises the specter that there isn't much of a limit to how these, uh, rules can be reinterpreted by the ATF if they s desire to push that limit, uh, you know, the ATF and the DOJ. Now, it doesn't mean that the, they would be successful in the long run, because as you've seen with ghost, with the, uh, bump stock ban, that's now been, uh, challenged in court and, and the last case uh they lost mm -hmm. um the the ban lost so you know it, it doesn't mean that that would you know lead to mass confiscation or anything overnight or or even be successful uh after litigation but certainly you can see the the path forward to wildly expanding the uh definitions to include uh things that weren't intended to be uh, banned or regulated under, you know, the National Firearms Act a hundred, you know, almost a hundred years ago when it was passed. And so, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I would say it's not a totally crazy, illegitimate concern to have. Um, it, it's, is it likely? That's a different question, right? Like you would think that the politics of trying to, you know, unilaterally ban millions and millions of new, uh, of currently owned guns, would not play well for Democrats in the upcoming midterm elections or going into Biden's reelection. But right. you would also you could also make that argument for nominating someone who literally works for a gun control group to be the director of ATF. And Biden did that anyway. So exactly. See, that's the thing. I don't I don't know. And, and frankly, this is I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a bipartisan statement uh, because I, I see this uh, on the right as well as the left. I don't know how many rational actors there are in Washington, D.C. these days. Uh, you know, you and I are sort of approaching this from this rational perspective because you're right. There would be blowback uh, if Democrats tried to do this before the midterms. It would become a huge issue uh, mm -hmm. if they waited till after the midterms. Well, maybe we'll maybe we'll get gains and you know, we won't need to do this. We can act through Congress uh, to pass Biden's gun ban. Um, you know, if, if they waited until, let's say, 2023, you're right. It would still become a campaign issue in the presidential elections and in the 2024 elections. But I, I don't I don't know that a many Democrats care about that, particularly those in those safe blue districts who are the ones who are really pushing hard 
uh, for the party to to take a hard left turn here. Right. And they believe that this is sort of their best window of opportunity between now and November of next year uh, to to reshape this country. And that's why they're, you know, leaning on Joe Manchin to, to nuke the filibuster. So far, he's held firm there. We'll see if that continues to to be the case. But uh, in the absence of being able to get things through Congress, I think that there is a a desire and a bit of a desperation from some Democrats to 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 do as much as they can, however they can, while they still have the ability to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. And and obviously, again, that's also a bipartisan impulse uh, out there uh, to just sort of when you have power to use it as much as you absolutely possibly can, um, because you might not have it for a long time. Of course, the, that thinking often leads to you losing power in elections. Um, of course, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I think certainly there's a, there's definitely a contingency inside the Democratic Party that wants to push as far as, as absolutely possible the limits of executive power on, uh, restricting ownership of guns. Uh, and, and I, and I would even say that President Biden himself is probably further to the left of his, the rest of his own party on a lot of these things. I mean, Chipman's, position that he wants, uh, uh, you know, so-called assault weapons to be banned and then placed under the NFA is is far outside of what Democrats in Congress are willing to vote for, for sure. They didn't pass an, even a ban on sales of assault weapons last Congress when they had a bigger majority in the House. They're not going to pass it this year and certainly not going to pass in the Senate. Um, uh, and But it is what exactly what President Biden says he supports, too, at the same time. So it's, you know, the president himself is pretty far left on this issue compared to even his own party at this point. So, uh, you know, he's been at least publicly <coughs> signaling that he's not as comfortable with pushing the bounds of executive power. But, um, on, you know, on, like I believe at the beginning of his term, there was at least um, a leak from one of his uh, off the record meetings with uh, activists where he said he couldn't just go out and ban the AR-15 and and uh, other firearms by executive fiat, that that's not possible, uh, you know, under uh, the current legislation. But at the same time, like, you know, presidents tend to uh, evolve on their perspective of their own power over time, especially when they aren't getting what they want from Congress. Um, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if he keeps pushing forward on this issue. I mean, again, the politics don't seem to favor him making huge dramatic, you know, new bans uh, unilaterally. But, uh, you know, you never you never know where it's going to go. And I do think that President Biden is particularly uh, committed to pushing the limits, um, or at least he's he is a supporter of further left policies than even, uh, you know, most of his party in Congress is. Absolutely. Well, and, and, you know, if you think about it, I mean, Chipman is on the record as far back as 2018. Uh, saying that he believes that AR-15s and, and semi-automatic firearms should be placed under the auspices of the NFA. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can make the argument that Biden actually adopted the Chipman position. Sure. Uh, right. And, and that, you know, it, it, that these are the gun control. This is what the gun control groups have been advocating for and what they've been calling for. Um, and, you know, you had candidates like Beto O'Rourke uh, and Joe Biden. Uh, basically uh, adopt that position. I don't know that Biden actually came up with this on his own. I think this was probably an idea right. that was pitched to him and his campaign on the part of gun control groups. And he said, yeah, that that that's, that sounds acceptable to me. Yeah, certainly. I mean, Biden, especially during the primary, when you had people like Beto and, and Swalwell pushing for literal confiscation um, right out of the bat, <clears throat> Biden sort of triangulated a bit to go further left than what he had. You know, he was always obviously in favor of bans on sales um you know he he was uh one of the major supporters of the 1994 uh Sullivan's ban um uh which was just a, which was a ban on sales not a comp- you know there was no confiscation aspect or registration aspect to that and so now what he believes in is further left and perhaps he got there because he had to move during the democratic primary when they i mean democrats moved so far to the left on the issue that, uh, you know, it was hard to find um, a space, I think, for someone who was trying to run a more moderate campaign like like Biden. Um, and so the moderate position in the Democratic Party became, you know, a ban on sales and also registration under the NFA instead of just literal 
mass confiscation from everyone who owns them, you know, 20 million Americans or whatever, how, right. however Bide, Bide, Beto's plan was supposed to work. There weren't any details to it, of course, but, but yeah, so certainly he moved, um, and did move towards what the gun control groups had been advocating for up to the, you know, at that point in time. And so, yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that Biden moved to the Chipman position rather than the other way around. But, but the point there is that like Chipman's nomination is going to be hard. It's going to be a hard sell. It'd probably be right at if if he can even get confirmed, which is not clear at this point. Um, it'll probably be right around fifty votes to do it. Um, yeah, we were talking with uh, Alan Gottlieb earlier this week. Positions. Right. And when we were talking with Alan Gottlieb earlier this week, he mentioned, uh, you know, for uh, on the Republican side, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, who have sort of, you know, they're 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 the ones who I think have given the most deference to to the idea that a president should be able to uh, appoint whoever he wants to these positions. Um, neither one of them have come out and specifically said, yes, we're giving the uh, thumbs up to, to Chipman. Right. Uh, among Democrats, it's you know, again, it's the it's the twosome of uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema from Arizona. And and what we're hearing, you know, I've seen a number of reports indicating that both of them are leaning towards supporting Chipman, uh, barring uh, a, a disastrous performance, you know, during yeah, his confirmation Times, hearing. Right. Times recorded that, yeah. So so then the question becomes, was this a disastrous performance for David Chipman as far as Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema are concerned? I would argue you look at Joe Manchin's comments on AR-15s, you know, and back 2013, he he was all in favor of uh, more regulations for AR-15s. But by 2018, 2019, he had moved to the position of, look, none of my friends are committing crimes with these guns. Uh, I, I don't see any reason to ban them. Uh, when Beto O'Rourke said, hell yes, I'm coming for your AR-15s, his, his public response was, you're not coming for my guns. So now that you know, David Chipman basically reiterated Beto O'Rourke's statement of, yeah, I do believe we should ban these guns. And I, I believe that uh, even existing owners should have to either turn them in or register them with the government or face a 10 year federal prison sentence. You know, the, I guess the question becomes, is that does that give Joe Manchin enough of a reason to say no? Yeah. And on that point, I've, I've reached out to all the senators that you just mentioned there uh, and uh, Toomey says he's, uh, Toomey's office says that he's still, um, decide, making up his mind one way or the other. He hasn't decided. I think that's where a lot of senators are at now, at least publicly, is that they haven't decided. Um, uh, I just got comment back from Tester's office, from Montana, uh, Democrat, and he said, as a proud gun owner, Senator Tester believes ATF needs a strong leader to support the agency's law enforcement mission. Senator Tester will continue to review David Shipman's record and testimony to ensure he will support our brave uh, law enforcement officers, officers and respect Montanans' Second Amendment rights. Um, and I haven't gotten anything back from Murkowski or Collins or Cinema yet. Um, and Manchin didn't uh, want to say anything on the record either. So, uh, you know, it basically it's I guess it's still early in the game for this nomination. It seems yeah. like even though the hearing was just yesterday, there's still a lot of these senators are still processing um, exactly what they're going to do on Chipman. And I think a lot of them still haven't even met with him yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we'll have to see. Uh, certainly, I would say if it, it, it's not clear that he's not going to make it. That that much is, I think, <laughs> fair to say at this point. No, um, I think you're right about that. And I and I I think that, you know, ultimately, you're right. The The politicians are weighing their options and and one of those you know considerations is what the their constituents are saying so i, I would say that you know for all of these senators who have said well we're we're looking at his record and things that that should be a signal to gun owners in pennsylvania and alaska and maine and arizona and west virginia contact your senators and tell them what you think about this they need to be hearing from gun owners because you know the gun control activists are going to be trying to rally their forces to uh uh you know send comments to these senators so they need to be hearing from pro second amendment folks too yeah i mean certainly that's uh in our in our system that's probably the most important thing is uh exactly how many people uh loudly say something to their representatives uh, can, can have more influence than anything else than millions of dollars spent in, you know, TV advertising or whatever. And, and every town has, uh, been spending on a, uh, 
um, uh, pro chipman ad in DC the last week. I think they spent about half a million dollars on that. Um, and I believe the NRA is spending money in, you know, these key states, uh, opposing him on, mm-hmm. you know, with ads. So, uh, you know, there, there are efforts certainly on both sides to try and, uh, uh, influence, uh, this nomination one way or the other through, through, you know, advertising and then obviously through active direct lobbying. I believe the NSSF, uh, the industry's trade group, gun industry's trade group has met with Manchin and, and, um, Murkowski and a number of other uh, senators who are going to be key to this decision as well. So uh, we'll have to see, wait and see really at this point what these senators decide and, and yeah, what their constituents say to them probably will have a big impact on that. Uh, well, I certainly hope so. I mean, they, it, you know, it should uh, if uh, if they care about the uh, the will of their voters. Uh, mm-hmm. In the meantime, uh, you know, we we did have the hearing yesterday, but no vote was held. So um, you still need the Senate Judiciary Committee to actually vote on the uh, nomination of David Chipman. Uh, then that would go to the Senate floor and then, of course, the full Senate. So we we don't know when those votes are going to be scheduled um, and we'll probably get I would like to think at least uh, a little bit of a heads up, certainly when the Senate Judiciary know. Committee is going to meet. We'll well, we'll we'll be able to at you least know when the meeting is going to take I place, say right? They they did um, more. They did kind of wait until the last. They second did to say that he was going to testify at this hearing. So. They did, and they packed him. They they Which you know they 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 sandwiched him between all these other nominees, and we saw another a number of these Republican senators complain about this, saying, "Look, we've got five nominees here." And we've got five minutes to ask questions of all five. This is ridiculous. We we should be having, uh, you know, a separate hearing for for these important nominees because you had not only David Chipman, but you had the nominee to head up c- uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services. You had uh, the nomination for uh, yeah. uh, the head of DEA, uh, as well as a uh, district U.S. district judge and a assistant U.S. attorney. So, uh, yeah. U.S. Uh, excuse me, assistant attorney general. I mean, these were some pretty big nominations. Mm-hmm. And Democrats, I think, knew they knew exactly what they were doing, you know, putting uh, David Chipman right in between these other nominees. Yeah, probably. Although uh, I guess it's fair to point out, as uh, Senator uh, Durbin did, that Republicans uh, use the same tactic, uh, I guess, when Trump was president as well. So the Senate. But but it is I think it is a clear indication of when you're trying to, you know, push a certain nominee through without as much scrutiny as they might otherwise get. This is this is one way to do that. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Stephen, I know we'll be checking in with you again here very soon. Uh, In the meantime, before we let you go, tell folks uh, how they can find the reload, how they can subscribe, what they get if they subscribe. Yeah, uh, the reload we just launched, uh, you know, about a month ago. um, And you can head over to the reload dot com where if you sign up, we've got a free newsletter that goes out once a week to keep people, you know, on top of what's going on with guns in this in the country, often linked to uh uh, bearing arms pieces, of course, because you guys have some of the best coverage out there. Um, and then we also have paid memberships, which will get you a second analysis newsletter if you want to hear my, uh, you know, expert analysis of, of why these stories were so important this week um, and what's coming for, you know, going forward. And then uh, as well, you'll get access to member exclusive posts where, you know, uh, we do perhaps a little bit deeper dive on some of the topics that you know, are, are available on the free side um, because, you know, the, the reload is completely reader funded and we try to reach as many people as possible with our biggest news stories. But in order to keep going, we need that support from uh, the members, from the readership. Um, and in addition to helping support us, you will get these, you know, nice extra perks. And we even have three uh, co-founders tiers still available uh, through the end of the month. Uh, when, when we're going to stop selling them all together. Uh, and that comes with a lifetime membership and an actual range day with me, uh, you know, to go sh- shoot some sporting plays and have, have a good time. So, yeah, all that's available at thereload.com. Fantastic. Stephen Gatowski, founder of The Reload, with us here on Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. Always appreciate spending some time with Mr. Gutowski, and I would encourage you to uh, subscribe to his website, The Reload, uh, another excellent resource for those of you who care about our right to keep and bear arms. Right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We will start there with a, a story out of Roswell, New Mexico. Here's the uh, headline that doesn't really tell the full story. Shooting suspect to remain in custody pending trial. Well, as it turns out, this uh, shooting suspect who is going to remain in custody well-known to law enforcement, Dustin uh, Hunter, who's a judge there in New Mexico's 5th Congressional or 5th Judicial District, uh, granted a motion by the DA's office to keep 32-year-old Christopher Smiley 
in pretrial detention. Evidence presented that Smiley, quote, presents a danger to the community uh, and should remain behind bars. He faces charges of first-degree murder, willful and deliberate tampering uh, with evidence in the May 2nd shooting death of 27-year-old Brett Patrick at a convenience store there in Roswell. The prosecution argued that Smiley would represent a danger to the public based on a decade-long criminal record, which includes violent offenses, at least 13 probation violations over the past 10 years, as well as past failures to appear for several court proceedings. Patrick, uh, excuse me, Smiley is alleged to have uh, shot his uh, victim, Patrick, at least four times in the back and the side on uh, May the 2nd while he was parked at a gas pump outside of his uh, convenience store. He then reportedly aimed a gun at a woman who was nearby before he uh, quickly fled the scene. Uh, He was found May 15th uh, by police, taken into custody. We don't know, by the way, the extent of his violent criminal history, only that he has one. But, uh, you know, let's just highlight the fact that this guy has 13 probation violations over the past 10 years. We're told that, you know, if somebody doesn't get a lengthy criminal sentence uh, for a violent crime, instead they're sentenced to probation. We're, we're always told, the judge always says, right, well, if you, if you violate your probation, you're coming back and you're going to serve your soul, a full sentence. Clearly, that's not the case. Because this guy has violated his probation time and time again. With little to no consequence. And now, again, Christopher Smiley facing the most serious criminal charge a person can face. First degree murder. And he can't help but wonder if his uh, alleged victim would be alive today if the criminal justice system in New Mexico had done its job in the first place. Uh, Our armed citizen story from the great state of Utah. We wrote about this at DeBaring Arms earlier today. Armed teacher thwarts a kidnapping at a Utah elementary school. This happened on a Tuesday afternoon in Ogden, Utah. There was a uh, stranger who showed up on the campus of this elementary school and tried to abduct an 11-year-old girl. A uh, guy's name is Ira Cox Berry. Uh, police believe that he was under the uh, influence of uh, some type of narcotic when he walked onto the uh, playground there and uh, grabbed an 11-year-old girl who was playing there in the playground. A, a teacher who was armed saw what was going on uh, approached Ira Coxberry, demanded that uh, he leave the school. Uh, the man briefly let go of the girl, and the teacher was able to get her and uh, about 19 other students inside the building. And that's when uh, Ira Coxberry started trying to smash in the window. And then, and only then, did that armed teacher draw his firearm and detained the uh, man until police arrived were able to take him into custody. Uh, Lieutenant Brian Inion with the Ogden Police Department says this employee is protected under the Second Amendment. He followed all policy and procedure at the school, and in this particular case, did everything that he should have done to protect the innocent lives of the children at the school. And in this case, it is likely that a life was saved or injury to a life was prevented due to the actions of this heroic employee. School district praising the teacher as well. Uh, Jer Bates with the Ogden School District says a teacher intervened when there was a situation that threatened student safety. This teacher, this school employee, is a hero. We don't disagree with this at all. Yes, it was a very scary situation, something we take very seriously, but it came out with a good ending, meaning no students were physically harmed, no adults were physically harmed, and this was an incident where our emergency response protocols were acted out. I think probably everybody but gun control activists in Utah are glad to see this played out the way that it did. Gun control activists like Moms Man Action, of course, think that uh, there is no place for armed school staff, uh, even though we now have clear evidence that armed school staff in the right place at the right time can prevent tragedies from occurring in the first place. Speaking of being in the right place at the right time and willing and able to do the right thing, our uh, good deed of the day today, I've got to thank, uh, I believe this is uh, Tim, who uh, sent me this letter. Actually, uh, an email. Oh, excuse me, Tom in uh, Arizona. So, Tom, thank you for uh, watching or uh, listening to the program. And thank you for sending along this uh, good deed from Tom's hometown. Uh, This is from earlier in the month. A trooper released from the hospital. Good Samaritans uh, honored after uh, this uh, state trooper was injured in a multi-fatality accident uh, and was saved ultimately by Good Samaritans. Uh, The uh, Department of Public Safety Director, uh, Colonel Heston Silbert, says that uh, he believes that Reinhardt would have been among the fatalities in this wreck if not for the actions of two Good Samaritans, Carolee Irvian 
and Russell Rusty Christensen, who pulled the trapped officer from his burning vehicle following this accident. Silbert told them, quote, I am humbled by your actions. On behalf of Trooper Reinhardt, who I know recognizes what you did better than I do or anyone, because he told me personally, specifically, uh, about what you did. And the uh, DPS director said that the pair of Good Samaritans will be honored with life-saving and valor medals uh, during a a DPS award ceremony. Uh, Reinhardt was apparently responding to a request of a motor assist, and uh, when he got there at the side of the road, contacted the occupants of a, a 2003 Chevy Suburban, who said they didn't think that they had enough gas to make it to the next town, which is about 25 miles away. Uh, He told the occupants, I think you do. Go ahead and go, and I'll follow you just to make sure that you get there safely. So as they're driving towards Wickenburg, Arizona, the driver of a uh, Honda Accord apparently was uh, driving pretty recklessly, speeding, passing in a no-passing zone. The Accord then struck the Suburban head-on, which caused the Suburban to roll, come to rest on its passenger side. The Accord then kept driving uh, but was out of control and struck Reinhardt's patrol vehicle. Reinhardt's patrol vehicle uh, then rotated, came to uh, rest on the side of the road. A uh, Toyota Corolla that was traveling northbound was also struck by one of the involved vehicles. Uh, Reinhardt trapped inside of his patrol vehicle, but was uh, extracted again by uh, Irvian, who was the uh, driver of that uh, Toyota Corolla, the last car that was struck. Uh, Irvian said, all I remember from that night is our car spinning. Once I came to rest and stopped on the shoulder, I just jumped out of the car. I just noticed the carnage that was right in front of me I wasn't registering exactly what it was, but I knew that I needed to get out and help. Uh, Christensen said I could hear the screaming, and I ended up at the Suburban, which was the most southern vehicle in the accident. It was on its side. I helped one of the occupants out of there, but once I realized that there were other occupants trapped, there was no way to help them. And that's when they heard Officer Reinhardt screaming for help. Irvin says, I ran to him. Once I got to him, I realized there was a trooper who was trying to get out of his vehicle, but I wasn't able to help him. Bottom half of the door was stuck. I was able to grab onto the top half of the door and hold it open enough where I could get a hold of the trooper, and we both fell back from the car, but then I wasn't strong enough to pull him away. That's when Christensen arrived on the scene uh, and was able to uh, help extricate uh, the uh, officer and drag him to safety uh, far enough away from the flames that, again, engulfed his patrol vehicle. So in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, got to thank these two good Samaritans, uh, Carolee Irvin and uh, Russell Rusty Christensen, for their very, very good deed. That is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. want to thank you, as always, for being a part of the program. Don't forget, you can become a VIP subscriber at BearingArms.com. All you got to do is go to BearingArms.com slash subscribe and use the promo code GUNS to get 25% off of your VIP membership. Uh, we will be off on Monday, just uh, taking, you know, the Memorial Day holiday and observing it. But but uh, don't worry. We're going to have plenty of Second Amendment news and information for you at BarryandArms.com throughout the holiday weekend. And we will be back with more Cam and Company coming up next Tuesday, uh, right here, wherever you find us. Town Hall Media on YouTube, Barry and Arms Cam and Company on Rumble. Uh, and, of course, the Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher. Hope you have a great holiday weekend as well. And we'll see you next week. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.